all of human history. This is the talk show Hell Hates. This is Pastor Mike Online. And here we are coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting bunker here at Area 52. High atop Bethel Church. This is the talk show Hell Hates. And the more you listen, the more you know why. Good to be with you today. Um, I've got I've I've got an interesting theory, and it's it's brand new as far as me thinking about it. Nothing nothing's new to God. There is no new thing under the sun. So I'm not talking about some new doctrine that nobody knows about except moi. And, um, and you, you can't get it unless you get it from me. Not talking about that. Um, it's about serpents. And I'm using the, the biblical term, King James term of serpent rather than snake nothing wrong with saying snake there were snakes in the bible god sent snakes to those to the israelites that's true okay so i'm not not knocking that but i'm not talking about that i'm using the word serpent uh, because that is the the biblical term and and this has to do with with a a bible concept that is related to um the um mark of the beast and what i believe is the transformation that is going to take place one of these days. When I say the transformation that is going to take place one of these days, let me um, let me tell you what I mean by that. And I this this is going to go wacky and slow because it, I just I just thought of it this morning. Uh, which is usually a lot of times some some of the best ideas that I've had uh, come after I wake up in the morning and I'm like, oh, wow, that's cool. Whoa, that's cool. That's, I kind of say that. But I don't do it around my wife anymore because it scares her. So, you know, don't want to scare her anymore. By the way, uh, I'm going to ask you again to keep praying for my wife. Um, she had so many plans for this year. She wants to take uh, a, another vacation. She wants to go on a cruise uh, with some of our daughters. And um, she, was, uh, she was, had her mind all made up. And right now she is sitting with a broken shoulder and a torn bicep tendon and possibly possibly more and uh so she and then oh she's got this dog and um she's she's a cute little dog she really is uh let's see here continue Let me. I'm trying to get my my sound machine on because I think that's going. I think I'm going to use some sound effects here. And uh, this this iPad is so old. It's not. It's not even charging. Is what it's saying right now. So we'll just do what we can with it. But anyway, um, just pr- pray for her. She's. Um, I had. I had. She took her dog to the vet Tuesday, 
and her dog's got some kind of disease. Uh, she cannot hold her bowels. She cannot hold her uh, her uh, bladder, and um, so they just they decided to to put her down. Uh, and I I buried buried the dog uh, the other day, and uh, so just, just just pray for her, okay? I would appreciate that. All right, now let me tell you where I'm going with this. Let's get our King James Bible out and you know for some reason I don't like how these how everything is like let me try this I mean I don't like how everything is it's supposed to like fade softly something like that I guess but it's still doing it too quick anyway uh, let's go. Let's go here first. Let's go to First uh, Peter, chapter one, um, verse twenty-two. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, um, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart, fervently pure heart and you only get that from a pure god and a pure bible create in me a clean heart oh god that's psalm 51 and renew a right spirit within me um so th then in verse 23 being born again and I believe that this verse, along with others, is teaching us about the idea of there being two types of being born again. You can be born again of corruptible seed, or you can be born again of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever I love it so I think it's I think this is this is part of teaching that now let's go to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13 is chock full of verses about seed, about and what is seed, DNA. And this is where I'm going with this. This is verse after verse after verse in Matthew 13 about DNA. Um. Uh, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. Well, look ye there. What did he sow? He sowed seed. What is seed? Jesus says, um, the seed is the word of God. It's what it is. It's, it's, the, it's the DNA of God. The DNA of true Bible-believing Christians is the Word of God. This is, our, this is our DNA right here. Now, I feel very strongly that man should not mess with nature's DNA. I feel very strongly about that. I don't think man should, should genetically modify nothing. Which kind of means I believe man should genetically modify something. But no, I don't. I, I, believe, that, I believe that mankind should leave 
all DNA alone. God put it on this earth for a reason. We may not like the reason. We may not like the results. We may not like what it does to us. But that's let me show you a let me show you a verse. Man, I I like this. Proverbs. This is for everybody who's got a problem with something that happened in their life or something that is in them in in part of their body, part of the the makeup of who they are. Maybe, maybe, and I'm being dead serious, maybe you were born, you know, with three nostrils, okay? Being, Being serious. Maybe you were born... Um, with with no with no fingers. There's a there's a genetic defect there, and your fingers did not develop in the womb, and you were born without fingers. You know that, or any kind of birth defect that. When the baby's born, the doctors are going, hmm, instead of, hey, congratulations. Um, you may not like that. But I can tell you there's people that have been born with all kinds of defects and everything else that have given their life to the Lord and they rejoice. It's an infirmity. Sure it is. But they rejoice in infirmities, just like the Bible says. Max, uh, Max Palmer, uh, who I got to meet before he died. When, he was, when I was 16, he came to our church. He was, at the time of his height, when he was alive, he was 7 foot 11 inches tall. Uh, just, just barely away from 8 feet tall. Robert Wadlow was just a quarter of an inch away from being nine feet tall. So you can imagine. But, but I mean, this guy is humongous. And he married a wife. I'm not making this up. He married a wife that is like 4'11". She's not even five feet tall. Uh, it was just cute to see them next to each other. But... Uh, um, Max Palmer, uh, he capitalized on his size for a while. He, um, he got into uh, professional wrestling, obviously, and um, he, he, he starred in a couple of um, Hollywood movies uh, back in the late 50s. These B, you know, they, they call them B movies. Um, because they're not the best, you know, the production value isn't the best that money can buy in Hollywood, okay? The special effects are really dumb looking and all this stuff. But he's like a monster. They, you know, he's born a monster and he's, he's Mr. Monster Man. If He's the go-to guy. If you want somebody that is absolutely huge and monstrous looking, and so on. You go to Max uh, Palmer, and um, and and he's your guy. So he does a couple of movies, gets paid some good money. He's doing wrestling. He's getting paid for that. So he's got money, and he's got women. Just think about it. He's got women. He's got uh, a certain amount of fame. Of, you know, f- and fortune and whatever. And um, he's so happy with life that he checks into a, a really cheap motel with a bottle of whiskey and a pistol. And he's going to get himself drunk enough 
to where he can talk himself into blowing his brains out. And he reaches over. It's, I can't remember if it was for the whiskey bottle or the gun or whatever, but his hand is directed and guided to pick up the King James Gideon Bible. Because back then, number one, they were all on top of the nightstand. And number two, they were all King James back then. So he's reading for the very first time. John 3, 16, Romans 3, 23, Romans 6, 23, Romans 10, 9 and 10, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, 1 John uh, 1, 9. Um, he's, John 3, he's reading these verses for the very first time and he realizes that all of these things that he has, there's no happiness in his life. He's a freak and he gets it. I'm a freak. And, but he gives his life to the Lord. God calls him to preach and he uses his size to get, you know, a crowd to a church so he can give his story and, and talk about Jesus, talking about how God saved him. I love that story. But in, Pro, in, in Proverbs 16, verse 33, this would be Max Palmer right here. The lot is cast into the lap. And what that means is whatever they used to gamble with, they called it the lot. And it, it basically represents the randomness of whatever it was that they used. Let's, let's say for our purposes, it's a, it's a pair of dice. And the dice is rolled. You want, you want double sevens, but that's not what you got. You got a, maybe a, a four and a one. And, um, in, and you're stuck with that was tossed into your lap, and that's what you got. Now, you can be mad at the person who rolled the dice. You can be mad at them all you want to, but it's not their fault. They didn't choose those numbers for you. How could they? And the, and the verse finishes out by saying, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. And what, it, what it basically means is whatever number came up, that's the number that God wanted to come up. That's your number. God gave that to you. This is what you have to live with. Now live with it is basically what that says. And I love that verse. I love what it means. And I would encourage anybody out there who does not like how you are, what you have to deal with, uh, what, what sins that you are so easily drawn into and you can't stand it anymore and you're mad and you're the God why you let me do all this stuff and the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord do you think that God do you think that God just lets you get so far out into sin that God says oh you know what man I, I could yesterday I could have reached over and got you but today you know I was so busy with uh you know the whole Israel thing and I I didn't I didn't see where you were headed, and, I, and, and you got too far away from me, so I don't know if I can save you or not. God's not saying that, and he never will. He never will. All right, now, back to this transformation. Let's go back to Matthew 13. Now, uh, right here. In the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed, DNA, DNA, by the wayside. He that receives 
the the seed, the DNA into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word and anon with with joy receiveth it, yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also that receives seed, DNA, among the thorns, look at that, is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, the seed, the DNA, and, it, and he becometh unfruitful. But he that received seed into good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit, and bringeth forth, and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Now we have this one. The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good DNA, good seed in his field, good DNA. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares, which is wicked DNA, because it's poisonous. It has a toxin in it. He sowed this evil, wicked DNA seed among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up, and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, what didst not thou sow good seed or good DNA in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, dudes. Lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until when? Das harvest. The harvest. Why? Because we know that at harvest time, Everything changes. Everything does. Le uh, oranges that start out green turn orange. Apples that start out green and hard, they turn red finally. They change. There's a change that takes place. Um, oh, my goodness. I love persimmons. Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. But Missouri has got persimmon trees all over. And uh, there, there's one um, by, by the church here. And uh, you got to catch them just right. If you eat a persimmon before it's ripened, you'll regret it the rest of your life. It is the most bitter, dry, it'll draw your mouth up like this. Okay? Oh, it's awful. But if it's ripe, oh, it's a diabetic's worst enemy because it is so sweet and it is so good. I, I love them. And, they're, and they just grow wild. Okay, I don't, I don't know. Maybe, maybe there are persimmon farms out there. I don't know. But, and persimmon jelly, don't even get me started. Okay, but, that, that's, but that, that persimmon fruit has got to change. And if it doesn't change, if no change takes place, or 
it changes to something different. Well, then you know that, well, that's not what I planted. That certainly is not what I planted. So that's why the the harvesters have to wait until the ripening takes place. Because at ripening is when everything changes. And and, and think about it. Even, Even humans have a ripening. We call it uh, we call it a- adolescence, but it's basically the same thing. There is a change that takes place in, in a, a young lady and a young gentleman. There is a change that takes place in them where after that point, their body becomes fruitful. Now, their mind it's not ready yet to be start being fruitful, okay? But their body is, and it happens with everybody. So let there is coming a day, people, when a transformation is going to take place of every man, woman, child in this world. Every one of them. Some of them are going to be transformed by righteousness into righteousness for righteousness sake by Jesus Christ himself. We're going to be transformed into his image. We're going to be born again of incorruptible seed, DNA. There are everybody else in this world. Everybody. I don't care. It's it's everybody is going to be transformed into a, uh, how can I say it? Into a permanently wicked body. Let me let me uh, give you another example of this. I haven't got to the serpent yet. Um, let's see here. Yeah, here we go. 2 Corinthians 5. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. Notice that he's saying that our our clothing is going to be a house. (laughs) Well, it's it's an interesting shirt you got there, Bill. (laughs) Is that a two-car garage shirt? Yeah, you ought to see the pool behind it. <laughs> anyway, um, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be... That only took two seconds too late. Um, and I just lost my iPad again. Anyway, for we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. So, uh, verse 2 again. For in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. We don't want to go back to being naked again. We want to be clothed upon with the clothing that comes up from, that comes from heaven. Uh, Verse 4, for we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality 
might be swallowed up of life. So we have the analogy here of being clothed upon. So we're going to receive uh, not, a, not a strip down, but a clothing. Uh, it's like in uh, Revelation 19, where the bride, it, it was granted to the bride that she should be uh, arrayed in uh, these clothes that are fine linen, white and clean, for the fine linen is the, the righteousness of the saints. I said that right, I'm pretty sure. The righteousness of the saints, not the righteous acts or the righteous deeds or the do-goods or whatever. We cannot do good to earn our wedding garment. We can't do it. We can only trust in God that he will grant for us to be given the clothing that God's going to give us that is going to uh, transform us and cover up the shame of our nakedness. And it's we're going to be clothed upon with righteousness so that when we pass before God in judgment and he looks upon us and he says, that is a righteous person there. Now, you know your life. You know, like, wait a minute, God, I, I've got, I got something to tell you. And God will say, you've already told me. I've already forgiven you. Enter thou into the joys of our, uh, uh, you know, of heaven. You, you've already been forgiven. It's been washed clean, made whole. Okay? And it, then I guarantee you we're going to be shouting. Now, there is a, a, another story that goes along with that. And it has to do with some Jehu. Uh, let's see here. If I can, boy, this is a good story too. Um, and I'm just kind of going off of memory here. I don't have notes on this. Jehu came forth. Uh, ah, ah, man is, okay, got it. Got it, got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. Second Kings 9, 11. Listen to this. This, this is a good story now. Now, I want you to think about it. See, when we're clothed upon, who does God see that we are? Christ. Christ. When we are clothed upon, God sees Christ, our Lord. We are wearing his garments, okay? Um, you come here to this area wearing Cubs uniform. We don't, we don't go for that. We allow Cubby, he's our token Cubs fan. But you want to come to this town, this area, you wear Cardinal Red, okay? Like this, like this, okay? I don't mean like Catholic Cardinals, I mean like Yadier Molina and all those guys. Anyway, uh... Watch this now. Jehu, he just he's already killed uh, Jezebel, I think. I'm not I can't remember. But anyway, then Jehu came forth to the servants of his Lord, and one said unto him, Is all well? Wherefore came this mad fellow to thee? And he said unto them, You know 
the man and his communication. It is false. Uh, tell us now. And he said, Thus and thus spake he to me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I have anointed thee king over Israel. Then they hasted and took every man his garment, put it on. No, that's not this. That's not the story. Um, this is this is about all the peop all the people who serve Baal. I like this one here. And it came to pass when Joram saw Jehu that he said, Is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, What peace so long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many? And I can tell you, I can tell you from experience. If you've got a Jezebel in your life, if you've got a Jezebel spirit on you yourself, if you've, if you've got a Jezebel in your family, if you've got a Jezebel in your church, I'm here to tell you there is no peace and there will be no peace until that Jezebel is gone away. Period. The end. And it may hurt to lose some people out of your church. It may hurt. But in the long run, you are going to be much better off. I've had it. I've done it. I've dealt with it. I've spent days after that licking my wounds, feeling sorry for myself. But I had to do it. Just, just for the sanctity of God's house here at this place. Uh, now, let's see here. How about the, the, the chariot and Je Jezebel and Jehu wrote letters. Ah, we're getting there. We are getting there. We're getting there. So the house of Ahab. And get all the people together. Ah, oh, here we go. Here we go. Right here. And Jehu gathered all the people together and said unto them, Ahab served Baal a little. But Jehu shall serve him much. Now Jehu is putting on. Is what he's doing. He is. He, he's lying. He is deliberately deceiving those people. Why? God is going to use him to get rid of all the Baal worshipers. And you ought to see how he does it. Man, it's slick. Slicker than snot on a door handle. Okay? Now watch this. Now therefore, call unto me all the prophets of Baal. All his servants and all his priests, let none be wanting, for I have a great sacrifice to do to Baal. Whosoever shall be wanting, he shall not live. But Jehu did it in subtlety. Oh, I love the word subtlety. Do you know why? Because God hid the letter B in that word, and you'd never know it. That's pretty good, isn't it? Subtle. Where's the B? Shh. It's hiding. But Jehu did it in subtlety, <laughs> subtly, to the intent that he might destroy the worshipers of Baal. And Jehu said, Proclaim a solemn assembly for Baal. And they proclaimed it. And Jehu sent through all Israel and all the worshipers 
of Baal came so that there was not a man left that came not. And they came into the house of Baal, and the house of Baal was full from one end to another. And he said unto him that was over the vestry, Bring forth vestments for all the worshipers of Baal. And he brought them forth vestments. And Jehu went, and Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, the son of, into the house of Baal, and said unto the worshipers of Baal, Search and look that there be that there be here with you none of the servants of the Lord, but the worshipers of Baal only. You see what God's doing here? Listen, people, are you paying attention to your Bible? Or have you gotten so scared by the ignorance of the internet scaremongers you have got you you've been listening to the same garbage for years and they make these wild predictions do you remember do you remember when i showed you when that bomb, now that bomb, when that warehouse blew up in Beirut, Lebanon, and somebody sent me a story that was a pure lie, where this guy who claimed to be former CIA, and he was all kinds of hot shot, and he was a guy in the know, man, he knew the inner workings. He knew all the... He was an insider. And he said, that was a nuclear suitcase bomb that went off there. And that was, uh, like, that was like the CIA that did that. Or it was some, some... You know, maybe it was the NSA that did it or something like that. But they exploded a nuclear bomb there. And, it, and that's what caused that big explosion there. And they had... They had manipulated a photograph or a video, a piece of video. They reversed the, the negative on it where instead of it, you, you know the difference between a, a positive and a negative in a photograph, right? You get the negatives and they turn the negatives into pictures. Well, somebody had taken a part of the video, turned it into a negative and said... This is um, this is um, um, infrared recording that clearly shows that there was a missile on its way there, and I got an app on my phone that takes pictures that are negatives and reverses them to positives, and I showed you that's. All somebody did was, that wasn't an infrared picture. That was a picture that somebody took and turned into a negative. And I reversed it. It's just a picture. And somebody drew a rocket on there. Now, how many years was that ago? Three years, four years, something like that? Where's, where's all the uh, nuclear fallout? I mean, you know, when you blow up a nuclear bomb, you've got radiation everywhere. Where is the nuclear fallout? That happened three, four years ago, and yet no fallout. And the idiot that sold you that bill of goods Still alive, still thrives on the internet. He's still spilling out his vomit, and everybody's lapping it up. What happened to all the people that were supposed to die? And you know why, because I, YouTube won't let me say it. But 
when this certain thing came out after the C O R O N A Where's all the millions and millions and millions and billions of dead people? I still have the article that Mike Adams put out there that said most of you reading this article will be dead in five years. I still have the article. We're in year four right now. Hadn't happened. There should be a clear line between those who are born again and those who are ignorantly avoiding the gospel and have traded the gospel in for the internet. There should be a clear line. And I hope and pray that you're on the right side of the line. Now, Jehu sent through all Israel, and all the worshipers of Baal came, so that there was not a man that left that came not. And they came to the house of Baal, and the house of Baal was full of from one end to another. And he said unto him that was over the vestry, you know what the vestry is? The religious garments. You see... We don't wear religious garments made by man, do we? Because what if somebody's wearing religious clothing that would belong to someone who is a holy man? What if that guy has got, a, got two or three mistresses He's a drunkard. He's even doing a little dope on the side. And of course, you know, the number of boys that he's destroyed in their lives. But he's wearing religious clothing. He's wearing holy vestments. That's, I mean, that's, that's how it is. The clothing that we're clothed with comes from God, not man. That's why you don't see me in a robe. What, what did Jesus say? Je, look up what... I think I can find this real quick. Real quick. Long. Uh, where is it? They love to wear long... Clothing. Here it is. Mark 12, 38. And he said unto them in his doctrine, Beware of the scribes which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplace. Hello, Father. Oh, hello, Father. How are you, Father, today? Oh, it's so good to see you, Rabbi. Oh, it's so good to see you, Bishop. Oh, it's so good to see you, Imam. Oh, look, there's Reverend. There's Reverend so-and-so, Dr. So-and-so. Oh, it's so good to see have you in our house, Dr. So-and-so. Jesus hates that. It's called the, the Doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Now, where was I with Jehu? Now i got to start all over again. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, okay, right here. Now, watch this. Uh, the, okay. Verse 22, and he said unto him that was over the vestry, bring forth vestments for all the worshipers of Baal. And he brought them forth vestments. 
And Jehu went and Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, into the house of Baal and said unto the worshipers of Baal, Search and look that there be here with you none of the servants of the Lord, but the worshipers of Baal only. And when they went in to offer sacrifice and burn offerings, Jehu appointed fourscore men, eighty men, without and said, If any of the men whom I have brought into your hands escape, he that letteth them go, his life shall be for the life of him. In other words, anybody that gets past you, we're going to kill you. So, verse 25, And it came to pass, as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, that Jehu said to the guard and the captains, Go in and slay them, and let none come forth. And they smote them with the edge of the sword, and the guard and the captains cast them out and went to the city of the house of Baal. Uh, and they brought forth the images out of the house of Baal and burned them. And they break down the image of Baal and break down the house of Baal and made it a draft house. You know what that is, a draft house? That's a public toilet. That's what it is. Where people brought, they either went to the bathroom there or they brought their chamber pots there and dumped it. That's what God thinks. That's what God thinks of St. Peter's Square. That's what God thinks of uh, Joel Osteen's former basketball court church. That's what he thinks of it. That's what I'm going to do to it. I'm going to turn it into a draft house. How's that? But the point in all this is they dressed all the worshipers of Baal in a certain uniform so that they are easily recognized. And in dressing them with the vestments of Baal, they're putting on Baal. They're putting on Baal. Just like we put on Christ. They have put on Baal. Okay? Now, they identify with Baal. They serve Baal. They want to appear as Baal and look like Baal because Baal is their God. We, however, we want to be like Jesus. We want to serve him. And I want to be clothed upon, not with long clothing investments that were made by a nunnery or a convent or whatever that was specially made for me uh, because of my holiness. I want to be clothed upon by God himself. Okay? So do you see now? Watch it. Them being clothed upon with these vestments of Baal. That's, that's the transformation, the ripening, the harvest that's going to take place. You see what I'm saying? You see what I'm getting at? Whereas we put on Christ uniform, they are going to put on Baal's uniform. So then it's going to be really, really easy. I mean, in sports, why do they have two sports teams wearing different jerseys? So you know who to throw the ball to. So you know whose brains you're going to bash in in the football field. Okay? So you'll know not to hand the ball to a guy on the other team while he scores a touchdown, wins the whole Super Bowl. So you'll know that these things have to be this way. You know, you're, 
you rec they are recognized for being on their side. You're recognized for being on your side. And that's how it's supposed to be. You don't wear the clothes of Baal, people. Don't wear Baal's uniform. Don't do it. You might think that it will make you non-offensive to people. You might think that, uh, well, I'll wear Bale's uniform for a little while and uh, over time I'll let people see that I'm I, I'm wearing Christ's uniform slowly but surely. Uh-uh. It does not work that way. When you get saved, I mentioned this last night, when you get saved, you're wearing Christ. You're on Christ's team now. And you better be content with that. Because I've met people, I've seen people come in and out. They put on God's uniform, Christ's uniform, and they hated it. They hated it. And so, fine. You go back, put Baal's uniform on again, because that's who you're going to live for anyway. Now, uh, I should have known it was going to take this long. Let's 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 go to Genesis chapter three. I got something I want to run run by you. Oh my goodness, my sinuses are swollen and everything else, all this juniper pollen. Missouri is full of cedars. Um if you come to Missouri and you see a section of woods that's all cedars, all cedar trees, at one time that was an open field. More than likely it was a, it was a field that somebody uh, either planted or sown uh, or th that they raised cattle in or something like that, but it was a, it was a used field. And what happens is in Missouri, when you don't uh, tend to a field or an, an open patch uh, there, if you don't tend to it, it becomes fallow. And, uh, and within 50 years, it's full of cedar trees. They just take over, okay? And... Um, so that's, I can go somewhere else. I, I remember doing this back a few years ago when it really hit me bad. I mean, I wanted to dig my eyeballs out with a back scratcher. Okay, I just wanted to like, and rip them out. And I remember f feeling that way. And then we had a, a church to go to to preach at down in northern Arkansas. And when we got down there, instantly it was gone. And I'm like, wonder what happened. And because down there, apparently, it's not it does, the cedars don't take over down there. Anyway, I'm wasting time. I got something I want you to think about. Let's read this story. Something that we know, we've known it for years, and I'm I'm telling you, you you can't read this Bible too much. You can't. Now, you may not collect it all as you read it. You may not get it all. But I'm telling you that there's more, there's more in this, this little section right here than you could possibly fathom. And it just thrills me after having read this so many times, practically haven't memorized, 
and all of a sudden, bada boom, bada bam, there's an understanding there I never thought of before, but it's right there. Now the serpent, and I want you to think of a serpent, okay, was more, there's that word is again, subtle. Where's the bee? The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. Number one, he's doubting God's word. Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Did God really say that? Wow. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now, I believe women in the Bible are types of churches. Eve is a type of a church or a group of churches or whoever, and it's not limited to one, who doesn't have a problem adding something to God's word that God never said. He never, ever said they couldn't touch it. Never said that. I, I don't know where she got it. It doesn't say that she got that from Adam. Because Adam, Adam was pretty clear on what God said. I'm pretty sure he was. And um, right here is where God said, the Lord God, oh, I like, I like this. Watch this. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, I'm going to outline all the words that God said. Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And if you look down at the bottom there, uh, or do hit control D, You'll notice that there are exactly, uh, where is it, where is it, um, 39 words exactly that I've just underlined here. 39 words. Now, this is the commandment of God. This is the law of God, right? So think of the law. The law of the Old Testament has 39 books in it. And God just spoke exactly 39 words to Adam, giving him the law. Isn't that, isn't that neat? I love that. But he didn't say a word in here about not touching it. Not a word. She made that up. And for whatever reason, told it to God. You know, it, what it does, it sounds like, it sounds like the Jews who took the, the Old Testament and they said, you know, I see these Ten Commandments here and I see where it says, uh, thou shalt not steal. You know what? We should probably write an entire 10-volume commentary on what does it mean when God says, Thou shalt not steal. We should probably write this big, huge, long uh, commentary or whatever on that law. And they did. And then years later, after they had after the Jews had read 
that commentary, they figured, you know, we better come up with another commentary so that everybody understands the first commentary that we came up with. So they wrote another one. And that's why Jesus said, you've made the, the, the word of God and the commandments of none effect. You basically destroyed the whole Bible by adding all those stupid words to it. So, that, I mean, that's what they did. And, I, and, and to me, that's kind of like what Eve did. She said, God said we cannot eat it, neither shall we touch it. Because, you know, if you, if you touch it, well, then you might be tempted to want to touch the fruit. And if you touch the fruit, well, then you might be tempted to want to smell it. And if you smell it, you might be tempted to, you know, take a little lick here. And then if you lick it and, and like it, maybe you, you, might just, you might just bite the fruit. So we're going to say you can't even touch the tree. There shall be no touching of the tree. Anyway, that's, I mean, that's the Jews right there. And it's the Catholic Church, too. And it's the Mormon Church. And it's God only knows how many churches... And I'm going to say, including fundamentalist churches who add and add and add and add all of these requirements before they come to the conclusion that you're saved. You may have just poured your heart out to God in for mercy and asking, begging God for salvation, and you you rise up uh, clean and white and pure before God, and there's always going to be some church people somewhere saying, "Well, I I don't think they really got saved," because if they really got saved, then they would start doing this and they would start doing that. And they would start wearing this, and they would start they would and they and they would uh, uh, stop eating things like that. They they wouldn't do that. They wouldn't feed their kids, uh, you know, sugar and candy. And if they were really saved, they wouldn't do all those things because those things, we try to please God by you know please by cleaning this tabernacle. And I hear people stuff like that all the time. I, I got to get back to the serpent, or I'll never, I'll never get, get anywhere. Um, the serpent had these words to say, and um, we've we've seen, we've seen over the years that we have studied. Um, these words, there's 14 there, and then there is 32 there, it makes it 46 total, okay, 46, and we know that 46 is related to the number of chromosomes that God has packaged our DNA in it. Now, let me... Uh, I, I, I know I don't have enough time to really give this um, the merit... that it needs to, for us to understand it, okay? But you look at all these pictures here, okay? Um, ophiolatry is basically, it's what it is, a serpent worship, okay? 
And this is what I was thinking this morning. Notice how, okay, look how this guy down here, he's worshiping this cobra. He's worshiping this serpent. Here this poor, ignorant Hindu, he's worshiping, here's a seven-headed serpent. And I want you to look here. In fact, let me... Let me draw just a picture around this. I, what does that look like to you? Let me see if I can tr trace this. Okay. There. What does that look like to you? Notice this lady. This is a African ophiolatry. There is a, I think, I think her name is Mama Wata. And um, she brings the divine serpent um, to people and she gives them, the serpent is always known for wisdom. Okay. Um, okay. Um, this would be like Quetzalcoatl, but I think it's a different one. And notice this um, Mr. Chicken here. <laughs> what, what God do you worship? Cuckoo, cuckoo. Okay, that's that's how they say Amen. In their services, the, their, their, their high priest, after he's ripped someone's heart out and blood shooting all over the place, <clears throat> and he's quoting some sacred words from this serpent god uh, that they're all worshiping, and everybody says, cuckoo, cuckoo. Anyway, notice what he's carrying. He's carrying the divine serpent now um, I think let me get to yeah let me get to let me get to this Come on, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. And then I'll let you go and we'll we'll pick it up on Tuesday. I because I really I really wanted I really want to do this. Here's a cockatrice. That's mentioned in the Bible. It's you know, I know it looks dumb, you know, you've got this great superior God, a god of war, and he's riding on this this four-horse chariot. Think about that one. He's riding in these, com they're coming in this chariot. We know what that is in the Bible now, don't we? Okay. Um, but he's got the head of a chicken. Okay. He's got a brain about that big. But anyway, now, right here, this is where it's going to stop. This is Chichen Itza, El Castillo, and here's what's, here's what's interesting. See the steps on this stairwell here. If you added up the steps on all four sides, you're going to get 364 steps the last step is the top here wherein you have 360 the the 365th step so it represents a year is what this was supposed to represent it represents a year now in this one every year at Let's say uh, June 21st, 
Yeah, 91 steps on each side, 364 with the capital making 365. Notice that you have the crooked body of the serpent descending down from heaven with his mouth open and he's got, I don't know, something coming out of his mouth, maybe holy fire or something like that. And he's giving that now to mankind. He's going to give what comes out of his mouth to mankind. Are you catching this? The story we just read from Genesis 3. The serpent gave to mankind through Eve what came out of his mouth. Which was his poison. But the world calls it wisdom. And so he comes down from heaven and he brings from heaven this divine wisdom. He comes riding a chariot descending down the stairway from heaven to the earth. And he's come down here to transform mankind. And what would he have to do? in order to transform mankind. He would have to... What does, what does two serpents look like when they're twisted together? What do they look like? They look like DNA. What, what does a, a serpent, just one serpent... When he's coming down, when he's coming down here, let me get me up. I already got a pen here. When he's coming down here, what is he? What does he look like? Well, since he's just one, he looks like RNA. RNA is single strand ribonucleic acid rather than dehydrogen. Well, I, I went blank here. Uh, deoxy. Deoxy ribonucleic acid. He's single DNA instead of double DNA. And he's come down from heaven and he's going to give mankind himself in the form of DNA or RNA. And man is going to jump on this. Man is... They can't wait to get into the Temple of Baal and get that Baal uniform on. We can't wait. So hurry up, y'all. Come on in. Come, come on in now to the house of Baal. We're going to put these holy vestments on you. And you're going to, boy, you're going to change. And Jehu had it in his mind all along. When we get them all in there and get them all dressed in those uniforms, this is how we're going to tell the difference between someone who's worshiping Baal and someone who isn't. When we see them in that uniform, we're going to kill them. And there's going to be something. How, how is it that we think that they will be able to tell the difference between who has the mark and who doesn't have the mark when they start buying and selling things. Do you think that they will have some sort of code reader? No, I think it's, I think it's going to be simpler than that. 
I think I think a man is going to be able to just look at another man and say he's he's not with us. To that to us that's very clear. He's not with us. If he was with us, he would not be wearing that. He is with the Baal people. So depending on whose side you're on, he's either a good guy or a bad guy. But he's not both. And so I want you to ponder that. We'll, we'll, we'll pick this up and look at it um, because if you... It's like if you look at all the places in the Bible where serpents are mentioned, you're going to get you're going to get a, like a, a a clue as to what what that what that DNA is going to do. Remember, so, so let me just throw this at you, and we'll just we'll bust out of here. Um. Just think of it like this. When you're reading the Bible and you see the word serpent, serpents, okay, those two forms, think DNA or, or RNA. But it's a, it's a strand of DNA, like a virus. A virus is nothing but a, a little strand of DNA or RNA inside this this protective shell and once that shell breaks open it starts going to work on what it's supposed to do destroy the respiratory system or whatever but that's what it's it'll do what it's supposed to do once the shell breaks and so once in the body it dissolves and now this RNA can just go through and do all the damage that it wants to do. So we have in Genesis 3, the serpent being more subtle than any beast of the field. Um, Genesis uh, 49, Dan shall be a serpent, by the way. I'm not sure what that means yet. Moses casting his serp his rod upon the ground and it became a serpent. Pharaoh's men did the same thing, but they couldn't just throw theirs down and it becomes a serpent. They don't have that power. They had to use enchantments over it. Is how they had to do it. They had to they had to chant enchantments over it and say magic words and spells to get theirs to turn into um, into serpents. So do your do your study and uh, you know see what you come up with on that 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 serpents in the Bible will represent a really really bad strand of DNA that God is going to release into this world. Not, not man. God. Who was responsible for all the plagues in Egypt? Was it, was it man? No, it was God. So you, you need to quit thinking about what Bill, what, what Bill, Bill Gates, he's the most dangerous man in the world. He can kill us all. You need to quit worrying about Bill Gates. You need to quit worrying about the one who can kill the body. You need to worry about the one who can kill the soul. That's who you need to worry about. But just take that, pray about it, think about it, uh, meditate on it, talk about it. In the way as thou goest out and comest in, and all of those things. Boy, it's sure been good to be with you today. Amen to that. There we go. That's
That's the music we need. Good to be with you today. Thank you for your prayers. Pray for our team out that's feeding people right now. Well, not right now. It is uh, dark by now. Uh, and pray for Michael. Uh, I wish I could have gone with him this time. I really do. Um, but just pray for him and lift him up, if you would, please. Uh, pray for my wife, please, and lift her up, if you would. And uh, I certainly, certainly would appreciate that. All right? Hey, God bless you. I love you. We will see you later, alligator. After a while, crocodile.